So I'm going to be talking about a very classic subject. And here's the overview of, uh, well, I'll begin with a very really classic, uh, well, with the classic subject of uh, Jordan Wigner transformation, which you might have learned when you took a uh, quantum statistical mechanics class. And then um, I'll, 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 I'll try, the goal of this talk is to explain to what extent this can be generalized, this construction can be generalized to higher dimensions. And for that I need to explain uh, some auxiliary, well, in two dimensions I need to explain this auxiliary topological con uh, field theory construction on the lattice known as the toric, toric code. And after that I'll, I'm, I can um, explain how to use it to bosonize um, uh, in two dimensions. Now, and uh, I will argue later that um, uh, a similar strategy works in arbitrary dimensions, but there'll be more sketch there. I'll just uh, explain in principle why it should work there too. So, um, well, the Fermi Boson correspondence, of course, has many guises, uh, and uh, you know, the one can talk about field theory. And for example, there is a correspondence between free massless. Dirac fermion in one uh, spatial dimension um, and the corresponding massless boson is, uh, at some special radius. Or we can look at deformity the massive field theory duality between massive Turing model and the sign Gordon uh, field theory. And now, uh, or on, well, one can uh, also discuss the most of the case of Majorana fermion, which is dual to a quantum Ising chain. So basically, a discretized version of Majorana fermion is exactly dual to quantum Ising chain. Uh, and that's actually, you know, the context where Jordan Wigan transformation is usually uh, introduced. But it's actually a rather very general thing. In general, one can com convert, use this transformation to convert a fermionic system on a one-dimensional lattice to something bosonic, that is a system of spins. And this is this previous one, just a special case of this. And that's, uh, it's, I don't know how to, you know, a lot of work recently on, um, uh, fermion boson correspondence in uh, two plus one dimensions uh, in the context of field theory. Uh, I don't know how to understand the field theory dualities, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain how to generalize this, this lattice transformation in two dimensions, in two spatial dimensions, and then also, also in higher dimensions. Well, let me begin with uh, <coughs> reminding you what I'm trying to generalize. So. On the bosonic side, our basic, our basic model is a spin chain of some sort, and for it's going to be this spin a half chain. So Hilbert space is a product of uh, this factor, which each factor is just a Hilbert space of a single spin a half uh, particle. Uh, the algebra observable is simply the tensor product of this uh, local endomorphism algebras, and uh, um, the Hamiltonian is simply a sum of local terms like this. And what does local mean? Well. Uh, that's some of different things one can uh, mean by this, but what I mean is the following. Suppose you have a observable, some sort of observable localized, strictly localized on site K, which means uh, it acts as identity operator on, on all factors in this product, except one, at site, except the kth one. And then I say that the observable, that uh, this particular guy H, well, some particular term from this sum, is, um, has a finite range if this commutator is zero for sufficiently a large distance between the two guys. So essentially, um, well, I could also require something weaker, like maybe exponential decay or something of this commutator, but uh, I won't. And well, for future use also, let me denote the standard Pauli matrices acting on side J simply by, instead of saying it's sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, I'll just call them X, Y, and Z, because there are already too many indices. So uh, this is just Pauli matrices. Now, uh, and then the important operator called spin is a projection of spin on the uh, z-axis, just a product of these z-j's. And I will assume that it commutes with this whole Hamiltonian. So and then the, my spin system has a z2, z2 symmetry, this, you know, this uh, projection of the, uh, of the spin on the z-axis. Now, and then we have a <laughs> analogous fermionic notion called fermionic chain, even though it's not, not a standard notation. In this case, I have my Hilbert space as a, a tensor product um, of a Z2 graded vector space, and I'll take the simplest one. I have one dimension, I have a one-dimensional even subspace and one-dimensional odd subspace, which is denoted C1 slash 1. I put a hat here for the following reason, because when I look at algebra of observables, instead of using the usual product, I'll use this uh, super tensor product, that is, uh, 
odd variables, but say if you take odd variables in different for different factors, they anti-commute instead of commute. Odd, odd, observe, odd elements of this algebra anti-commute instead of commute. Um, so that's what what what, what, I'm, what I mean by tensor product. Well, so I use it here, and therefore sort of by extension I use it here. And here it really, really means this, uh, just the usual tensor product of vector spaces. So, so this, this algebra of observables is uh, isomorphic similar to Clifford algebra with two n generators. So on every s side we have, um, say, uh, uh, say you can say the, the, the two generate two odd generators, and uh, so we have two n sides overall. Oh, have n, n sides we have two n generators, and they're only commuting. So this is the two graded algebra, and the Hamiltonian is just a sum of terms. Each of these is even. That is bosonic commutes with the you know, well, well, with the grading operator. And we're going to assume that this guy is a finite range in the same sense. Um, and I'll denote, um, uh, you know, local uh, observables on each side. Well, there are different bases you can choose. For example, you can choose fermionic, fermionic creation operators, fermionic uh, creation annihilation operators, called C and C and dagger. Uh, they, they generate the whole algebra. Okay, purely abstractly, well, uh, the algebra of observables in the fermionic spin chain, just a matrix algebra of size 2 to the n to 3 to the n, so, um, and uh, the, for the bosonic chain, it's also a matrix algebra. So purely abstractly, they're just isomorphic, so what's there to say? Well, we don't, uh, we're interested in some local isomorphism, in the sense that you want uh, an isomorphism which maps um, um, local observables to local observables. More precisely, uh, I want something which maps uh, even that is, uh, even observables of the fermionic chain to observables of the bosonic spin chain. Uh, and well, on the bosonic side, one observable local observables which commute with the fermion parity that is are even on the and the on some uh, to map them to some uh, local observables of this spin chain commuting with this spin operator, that projection of the you know the z-axis. Um, and um, uh, the reason is because on a map, I want to be able to map every local Hamiltonian on the Fermionic side to local Hamiltonian on the Bosonic side in a way which preserves this, the whole structure of the operators. I want to uh, uh, some induce some uh, algebra isomorphism, at least for the even parts of the algebra. And this is a transformation. So that's called the jordan wigan transformation. So this is x's and y's and z's uh, live on the Bosonic side and c's and c daggers on the Fermionic side. Um, and um, this is not local, but because the c and c dagger uh, they are uh, odd ones, but once you take the any even observables made out of C and C daggers, you, you, they map locally to some local observables on the um, bosonic side. For example, the uh, fermion number on a particular side maps to this, um, or if you wish, the minus one to the fermion number of modulo two maps to just uh, plus minus well to the spin operator operate measuring spin on side J. So in other words, when you Correspondence is this that, uh, well, roughly speaking, that you have uh, on a particular side, you can have either zero fermions or one fermion. On the bosonic side, uh, you can have spin, spin a half cube, which can be either up or down. And my convention is that when I have uh, no fermion in the vacuum, it maps to spin up. And when there's a fermion there, it maps to spin down. So, and the, the, this isomorphism, this uh, like map, ensures that the, any relations between even combination of C and C dagger, which exist, uh, they are reproduced on the bosonic side, so that's. An well, I'm not sure, yeah, how to say because it's clearly non-local. So in, in some, maybe there's some something nice about this non-locality. Uh, probably there is, but uh, I don't know how to say it. Now, now I want to uh, generalize it to 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 two uh, two spatial dimensions, and. Um, it has been known for a long time, you know, in principle, how uh, what the trick is. Is the trick is to uh, use um, well. There's no way, no matter how you think about this, it's clear you need to introduce some uh, gauge fields into the problem. So, in the one in one spatial dimension, just map fermions to bosons, and bosons just sort of matter fields; they just spins. But in, once you go to high dimensions, there's just no way to do it, ex ex except if you introduce some additional gauge fields. And this is the version uh, which, uh, well, the, the, the simplest uh, gauge uh, field you can imagine is a Z2 gauge field. And this uh, so-called toric code is just a sort of Hamiltonian way to think about a Z2 gauge, uh, topological Z2 gauge theory. 
Now, I mean, why topological? Well, because I don't want to like, introduce, you know, in, uh, lots of degrees of freedom. I, I, you know, I want to map fermi fermionic degrees of freedom to bosonic spins, but then maybe also some topological degrees of freedom, so that, uh, the, you know, that, uh, um, so that, that um, locally at least, yeah, I don't add any degrees of freedom. So uh, how do I think about, well, well let me just have the story code and then I'm going to come back and couple it to uh, my matter degrees of freedom. So first let's pick a triangulation or to the manifold, which is seems to be oriented for simplicity, even though it's not strictly necessary. I have this uh, sets of I simplices of triangulation called TI. And the Hilbert space of, of the toric code is going to be product over all edges of this triangulation, over all one simplices. And well, each uh, factor is just, again, two-dimensional Hilbert space, so there's sort of a spin living on each edge. And the algebra observables is generated by the Pauli matrices acting on, uh, on n edges. Uh, now, um, one can define this operator called, called PV and PF. One for every vertex, I just um, pro take product of all x's, which live on the edges entering this vertex. And for, all f for every face, I take product of all z's, which uh, uh, live on edges, um, which are boundaries of this face. Um, and um, uh, these guys are important in the square to one, and they form these projectors out of them. And one can easily check that these projectors are all commuting. And the Hamiltonian is simply the sum of these all commuting projectors, one for each vertex and one for each face. So that's the Hamiltonian of the Tori code. Well, how is it related to Z2 topological gauge theory? Well, first of all, um, if you, look at the, you need to look at the ground states of this guy. And the ground states, since, well, all, all these guys are coming projectors, the ground state obtained if you just uh, um, uh, make uh, all these projectors annihilate your uh, state. And then, in other words, they're on the image of this product over all the sort of the other projectors with a plus sign. So, so basically, uh, these factors just project you to the states with trivial flux this flux one uh, for every triangle, while these projectors project you to uh, states of, for all this uh, subset of states which we have trivial flux, also uh, project to states which invary in a sort of, sort of uh, gauge transformation, Z2 transformation at each vertex. So that's called like a Gauss law. So if you just look at the ground state, then the space of states you get is precisely the, the same kind of space you would uh, co uh, construct in topological Z2 gauge theory. The states with zero flux, no flux for every, for every, uh, for, for every two simplex, which are also gauge invariant. Well, in, in condensed matter literature, one usually does something different. One doesn't like to impose constraints on the Hilbert space. One wants the Hilbert space to be um, simply a product overall, uh, like simplices of some dimension. So in that uh, so in this matter literature, people just take this parameter T finite. So there, there are states, in, uh, well, they keep all the states, uh, but if, if T is large, the, all the other states, which are not, set, uh, not on the image of this projector, they'll have a large energy so in regard to the excitations. Well, the ground states are precisely the states of the topological Z2 gauge theory. Well, from the point of view of energy theory, there's nothing wrong with gauge theories, so it's perfectly okay to impose things like Gauss law constraint. So. Um, I just regard this uh, Hamiltonian more like as a trick. So in the end, I really want to take T to infinity and then project to the ground states. Uh, so, but, uh, okay, so Tori code is basically some Hamiltonian whose ground states are produced by logical Z2 gauge theory, and the Hamiltonian is local. In fact, it's some of coming projectors. Now, um, from the point of view of a uh, meta person, there are also excitations um, in this. Uh, but that is states which do not satisfy some of these constraints. Well, excited states have energy as multiple of T, uh, and the basic excitation just have energy T, and the, and the two kinds, uh, electric and magnetic, which we call E and M. Now, from the point of view of, um, uh, if I take T to infinity, of course, these guys will just go away. So in order to keep the information about them, I'm going to consider modified Hamiltonians, which um, where you sort of, for, you, you're in, where the E particle sitting at some particular place on the lattice or M particle actually has zero energy instead of uh, uh, energy which diverges as T goes to infinity. So because if you wish you can, in, in the limit T goes to infinity, you have to uh, this E and M excitations become not dynamical states, but really sources, insertions of some source in the theory. And a source is basically some modification of the Hamiltonian. So for, say to insert a 
uh, electrically charged particle, the, the site V, where V is the vertex, you just need to add this term to the Hamiltonian. That's sort of, no, in my convention, when I have uh, a particle, electric particle, then PV uh, has eigen, eigenvalue minus one, and then it lowers energy, right? Then similarly here. Okay. So you can see that, uh, first of all, is it, well, so na naturally the, the electric particle lives on the vertices, and you know the magnetic ones live on faces. Um, they're also mutually non-local, which is not very o obvious here. To figure out, to, uh, there's actually a pi relative statistics between these kind of particles. That was, a, you can look up in Kitaev's paper, um, why that's true. So one needs to, for this to consider operators which move these particles around, or, or sources rather around. Um, so, but uh, that's an important f f consequence of the spy statistics is that if you take composite of composite of E and M, it behaves like a fermion, it's an emergent fermion. So, um, that's a well-known thing. So, uh, and I want to exploit that. So to do that, I want to rewrite this, uh, well, but it, it's a bit tricky because uh, I want to consider sort of composites of uh, E and M particles, but E, e particles actually live on vertices and M particles on faces. So uh, I need to sort of, uh, to associate, uh, I would like to sort of associate the vertex to every face. And to do it, let me do the following thing. First of all, I want to rewrite all this uh, stuff in terms of uh, cut chains on the simplicial com com complex T. So first of all, let me look at Z, oh, so what is a cut chain? Well, cut chain is simply Z2 valued function. Well, in my case, cut chain is valued in Z mod two. Z2 valued function on the set of, uh, say, P simplices, if I'm dealing with P cut chains. And, um, okay, so this uh, I have a standard co-boundary operator, which satisfies delta square equals to zero. Um, and I can rewrite, using this operator, I can rewrite my projecture. Well, first of all, uh, in this notation, I can think of uh, any, any st well, uh, a basis um, in the space of state auditory code, uh, which is simply labeled by elements of one k chains. Like if you, your one k chain on some edge takes value uh, zero, that means that uh, spin is up there. And if it takes value uh, one, then spin is down. So arbitrary, so natural basis just label is by it labels eigenstates of a, um, a Z E for any edge. So and I can think of it as a basis labeled by its k chains. Uh, and then uh, the constraint operators look as follows. So the vertex, uh, the one which acts on vertices, just simply shift k chain by uh, k boundary of uh, some particular zero k chain, the, namely the one supporting this vertex, sort of del delta like. Uh, the one takes value one on particular vertex and zero everywhere. And uh, the face, well, and the one supported with faces, does this. It's a diagonal on this basis and just multiplies either by one or minus one, depending on the weather. Um, sort of flux through particular phases zero or one. Okay. So that's just notation. Uh, now, um, and then with this notation, I can uh, now describe also, uh, well, I would like actually to descri describe maybe not just a uh, situation when I have just one M particle sitting somewhere, but some n number of M particles. And those can be, I can label, I can label the, t tell me, if I tell you all the faces where the M particles live, it just means I specified uh, a mod two Tuca chain, right? It just where it's zero, there's no particle there. When it's w uh, one, it, there's a particle there. So let's call this uh, cut chain beta two M. To M, just remember that it's M particle we're talking about. And then um, the Hamiltonian, modified Hamiltonian, something like this. First, you modify these constraints in the following way. You don't modify the vertex constraints, the Gauss law. You just leave them alone, but uh, uh, the other constraint, just modify like this, in, instead of, well, now you, instead of some state, if it's, a, it's the flux constraint says that, you know, if there's no particle there, then it's as before, but if there is a particle there, this M particle, then it's sort of reversed. Um, that is, I do, uh, the, the, the invariant state, the one, the one where delta alpha, where the flux is minus one instead of one, where flux is non-trivial. So, okay. So these are modified uh, constraints, in pres which sort of in the presence of these M particles. Now for the E particles, it's a bit trickier because E particles naturally want vertices. Uh, but I would like some sort of to force in the same formalism. For that, I need to add some extra structure on my lattice, on my triangulation. Uh, one, for example, taking branching structure, that is orientation of edges such that for every face, you know, you have, you don't have any closed loops of orientations. So 
one orientation also in the, in the opposite direction compared to the other two. And then you can, that gives you a natural order on vertices. So I can identify every two simplex with a standard two simplex. And then I can define a cup product uh, on cut chains, which you couldn't without this identification. It's asso associative, but not commutative. But that's not important for me. Just I, I just need associative. So, and then um, uh, with this convention, okay, I don't know what this means. I just ignore it. Oh no, I can't. Uh, let's see this one. Okay, but what did it want in the first place? Okay, maybe it seemed tell me that I should wrap it up. No, maybe not. Okay, so. Okay, so I define these guys. So again, um, when I have electric particles, I modify the constraints, but now they're different. So now it's the vertex constraint which is modified. Like the usual one is simply alpha gets transformed by sort of gauge transformation by co-boundary, but now also mul multiplied by some factor. And um, and beta two des des describes distribution of e, e particles. And now I don't modify the phase constraint. So this is, uh, that, that's how you introduce um, uh, some distribution of e particles. And then, well, then I can write down this uh, modified Hamiltonian, which sort of forces you to have uh, either E particles or M particles in particular positions. Um, okay. So I just um, um, insert this modified, modified it importance in the same Hamiltonian. Okay. And again, so some, you can easily check if there's still commuting projectors, by the way, so for any choice of this chain. So it's still an uh, integrable sort of Hamiltonian. And you can similarly can do it for magnetic ones. Okay. But however, I, I really want to yeah, emerge in this fermion particle insertion, not this bosons, E or M. I want the composites to be inserted. Well, it's straightforward. So the composite, I simply modify both in the same way. Now I modify both the vertex constraint and uh, the phase constraint with the same beta. Basically, I insert. Um, now, you see, but the point is when you have branching structure, for every phase, I do have a special vertex, maybe the zero vertex. And now I sort of insert, if I inserted the um, flux on some particular triangle, I also insert electric flux on the corresponding zero vertex. That's essentially what this does. Again, again, computing, commuting in the square to one, and you can just insert them into the for same formula for the Hamiltonian. And that's how we get um, this modified Hamiltonian for the Tory code, which sort of forces you to have um, uh, this emergent fermions, EM, at some particular spots given by this Tuka cycle. Okay, why did I do all this? Well, we'll see in a moment. So, in, let's just come back, uh, try to, what, what, what are we going to, uh, what, what are the bosonic and fermionic systems are going to consider? Well, if spins are going to be defined similarly as before, spins are going to be living on, well, you need to make a choice, suppose we live on faces of the triangulation. Um, and the Hilbert space is going to be tensor product, and the algebra observable is simply the usual tensor product of, this, of these endomorphism algebras. So I have uh, these Pauli matrices, X, F, Y, F, and Z, F for every phase. Um, and if you wish, you can label uh, these um, um, uh, spaces of uh, this um, spa uh, initial base in this space, Hilbert space given by uh, Tuka cycles. Uh, and then Z, F, X simply like this, simply by uh, multiplies by one if you uh, zero if the cycle is trivial and by minus one if it's uh, uh, non-trivial. So um, the total spin operator is simply the product of all these ZFs. That is of this basically it's the integral of the this cycle uh, um, beta over the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, two-dimensional triangulation. So um, so what are the observables which you commute with this? So I was interested in the in one dimensional case, I was interested in mapping some not just all observables, but just some subset of observables, around which are either preserve the spin or preserve this fermion parity. In this case, I preserve the spin because it's a bosonic system. Well, easy to see that the these observables, the e sort of the even one commuting with this guy, are generated by that first of all, this uh, observable which tell you whether spin is up or down on a particular phase, and this is the F. And then there's sort of hopping operators. Well, so what's the notation here? Well, hopping over is uh, uh, defined for every edge. So suppose I have some edge. Since I also chose orientation for this edge, this coming from this branching structure, then uh, I have a face to the left of the edge and a face to the right of the edge. I call them, call them L of E and R of E. And then on each of these faces, I have these X operators. So what does X operator do? Well, if the spin was up, 
flips it to down, spin was down, flips it to up. Let's say, so what, what this does is sort of flips the spin on um, one face, and but simultaneously flips it uh, on the ne uh, neighboring face. So overall, it doesn't. It preserves this total spin. So, that, so these are called hopping. So you have spin up, spin down. Just does this across the edge. Um, or if they're both like this, it just does this. Okay. So the whole algebra is generated by, uh, even sort of subalgebra, generated by these guys with some relations, which we'll discuss later. And performance is similar. So performance, we now have performance, performance ring on faces. That is, is a um, Hilbert space, which is uh, like this, where each factor is simply a copy of C1 slash 1. And the algebra is, again, a super tensor product that is uh, observe, odd observers living on different faces anti-commute rather than commute. And, you know, in this, uh, in two-dimensional case, uh, I, it's actually much more convenient to use not um, creation and annihilation operator basis for the observables, but the um, sort of Majorana basis. So this is like, a, say, C plus C dagger, and this is C minus C dagger times I. So they both all square to one, but then to commute. The generators of Clifford two, the standard, standard ones. Okay, again, I can focus on the even observables because that's what I want to map. So what are they generated by? Well, they're generated by the, uh, first of all, fermion parity of, on every face, which, which is written in terms of these gammas like this. And also this sort of hopping operators again, but now I define them a bit differently. I take uh, my run of fermion on, again, the, if given an edge, uh, there's a, uh, there is um, a face to the left, face to the right, which you call L of E and L of R of E, and they just take gamma to the left times gamma prime on the right. Now, if we compare these observables, they're kind of similar. Uh, so, uh, all these algebras of even observables. So, first of all, they're all square to one. And second, um, this operator's SE anti commute with this uh, spin up, spin down operator, uh, which on our neighboring faces they explained, but they commute with all others. Uh, the, the operator SE just changes this, the spin only on the neighboring faces uh, for, for edge E. And the same applies to the f this hopping over is for fermions, right? It only affects the fermion number on the faces right next to this edge, and it changes to the opposite one. Uh, but also, the big difference is, first of all, uh, while clearly these hopping operators for the bosons, the way I define them, just commute. Uh, they always for different edges, they just commute. They're all just made of Pauli matrix X. For fermions, they don't. Again, because of the, of the way I define them. Uh, actually, sometimes they commute, sometimes anti-commute. I will not write down the precise rule, but it's e easy to write down in terms of these edges, E and D prime, what the rule is. Um, and then there's another constraint. Like if you have, a, say, a, consider a, ver a particular vertex and all the edges issuing from it. If you look at the bosonic hopping operators, it's quite clear that you have product over the whole, um, uh, all, the f all the edges issuing from a vertex is going to be just one. But for this fermionic guy, it's something more complicated. There's some overall sign. And then there's a product overall Fermion parity operators on each face, sort of entering this uh, vertex. So that's quite different. This sign can be again written explicitly, but I won't try to do it. It's kind of elaborate. Um, okay. So what's that? How do I fix that? Well, I clearly want to identify this operator Z, you know, the spin up, spin down operator in the bosonic picture with the uh, minus one to the f on a particular face in the fermionic picture. But you see the, the relations, well, for the hopping operators, there's some differences. Um, what what it's supposed to do, I'm supposed to attach to every spin down state uh, also an, an emergent fermion from the toric code. So the idea is to come start with spins. Um, and if I want to somehow uh, get a fer something similar to a fermion out of this, I should to, uh, attach to each spin down guy an emergent fermion from the toric code. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, it means I have to enlarge my Hilbert space to contain a tensor product like this. Um, that is, this is a spin spa space of states. This is a toric code space of states. There's now I have now uh, now I, there's I have uh, spins living both on faces and on uh, edges. And I'm going to take this modified Hamiltonian, which I had for the toric code, which really is a, just a, a way to uh, put some local constraints on the Hilbert space. And I'm going to make that argument there. The argument, uh, this Tuka cycle, which told us where the emergent fermions live, 
where they're forced to leave, I just replace them with an operator in the spin, spin space of states. That is, um, here Z is this operator valued to a chain whose value on the i on some phase f is just given by the um, by the minus well by one if this spin is up and down if spin is uh, minus one if spin is down. So that essentially forces okay. So if that is if I project with if I take t goes to infinity and take sort of the projectors coming fr product of all the sort of reverse projectors, the image of this guy is going to force um, uh, emergent, emergent Fermi to see exactly where the spins are down. Okay. And uh, now I also want to somehow combine, when, when I hop something, when I hop some spin from you know, across the edge, I also want to hop this emergent fermion. So what does it mean to hop an emergent fermion? Well, let me define uh, this operator, which has the, actually can check, it sort of has the meaning of hopping emergent fermion across the edge delta, uh, across the edge E. So delta E is just one chain supported on this edge again. So why? Well, because um, uh, this guy here essentially means you hop the sort of magnetic, the M particle, and this one here means you hop the electric one. When you have both of these, you have hop them both simultaneously. Okay. Well, so there's these operators, uh, which uh, purely within the toric code, um, uh, which move around my emergent fermions. Now, this, uh, let me just uh, explain why they're good objects. Well, first of all, they're also square to one. And second, again, they, they change this um, uh, flux through a particular phase if it was there to the opposite one. Um, most importantly, if you look at how, wh whether they commute or anti-commute, then it turns out that they all sometimes commute, sometimes anti-commute. And the rule is exactly the same as for these fermion guys. That's the first hand that uh, they're relevant. That is, the, f the bosonic hopping operators were just always commuting, but these guys precisely have the right features to correct for that defect. Um, and finally, there's this other constraint. Remember, that if you take a look at the particular vertex and the product over all these hopping operators for fermions, you got something fairly complicated. Well, for bosons, you got just one. Well, it turns out that these um, Tori code operators have a similar property. If you take product overall uh, edges coming out of this particular vertex, again, you get some sign, uh, and product overall this number of emergent fermions and all the faces which actually share this vertex. Now, uh, so it's very similar, except, you know, first of all, there's a different sign, uh, and also, and also, instead of a number of physical fermions, a number of emergent fermions. Okay, but um, that's good because in the end, I'm gonna say just imagine that um, under the map, I'm gonna sort of bind to every spin down a, a state, this emergent fermion, and then I'm gonna map fermion number then to number of emergent fermions. So that's that's precisely gonna become well. That, that's actually a good feature. So this suggests the following map. So first I'm going to uh, map uh, fermion number, on, uh, well, minus one to the fermion number to the spin up, spin down operator. And as for the hopping operators, I'm going to map them to some maybe sign factor times the hopping both for the toric code, emergent fermions, and for the spins. So th this guy is simply there to fix up problems with these S's. Um, well, we can fix this D of E a bit later, but first of all, the point is now that these new guys, so th these guys here, they commute and anti-commute precisely for the same pairs of E and D prime for which these guys commute or anti-commute. And second, they say this are almost the same um, uh, constraint for, the, for each vertex, that is, if you take product um, over all these guys from particular vertex and, and over all these, guy, these guys, they actually map to each other because Fermi parity maps to this guy. Up to some C number sign. So, now, well, to fix to, for it to work, you need to make sure the additional constraint is satisfied. If you take any vertex, and then the product of this signs for every edge must satisfy this. So, the C, remind you, so, so the two different similar looking things. First of all, product of all the U operators had some C tilde, and, products, and product of all the fermionic guys had a similar factor. So, for the whole thing to work, work out, you need to make sure that these edges, edge signs are chosen correctly like this. So uh, mathematical interpretation of this is the following. So, well, it just, um, 
you can think of this as just a z2 valued function on vertices that is a, a zero chain and uh, d of e should be thought of as um, one chain with values in z2 again and this condition is simply saying that um, uh, this uh, one chain is a trivialization so the, that is the boundary of this one chain is a zero chain um, now, so if you, if you found one solution for this, then there are, of course, many others, because you can add any closed one chain. There's one cycle to this D and still going to get a solution. Now, first of all, also, like, well, actually not all cycles, not, don't care about all, all one cycle. So if you have a one cycle, which is a boundary of a two cycle, then you can simply absorb it into some redefining uh, this um, axis. Well, S is made of axis. You can just absorb... Uh, uh, that by um, that, that particular, well, if you want to as a boundary, they can absorb this sign into definition of x's on, on, on all the faces. So, um, so really, um, well, if you want one such sign, then number of distinct possibilities actually labeled by elements of the first homology group of this triangulation. Okay. So we're almost done then. Uh, um, if it's really true, then uh, this map, if you can solve this equation, then this map. Uh, provides the desired local uh, embedding of the fermion, even part of the fermion uh, uh, algebra into this um, bosonic algebra, where bosonic means tensor product of the toric code uh, and the spin system. Well, what is the meaning of this condition, this funny condition? Well, it turns out that this, this zero cycle actually Poincaré dual to a Tuca cycle, which represents the second Stiefel Whitney class. And um, um, also assume that everything is orientable. So uh, this class was trivial. That is, it's exact. It's a, the corresponding Tuca cycle is uh, exact. So the corresponding dual cycle is also exact. But therefore, the solution for this DOE always exists. So why did this happen? What's the relation between this funny condition and why, why should a stiefel whitney class appear? Well, see, stiefel whitney class is an abstraction having a spin structure. Well, I'm assuming that the first Tiffel Whitney class vanishes. So its trivialization defines, in other words, a spin structure. And basically, this one cycle is a lattice analog of spin structure. So what I find that the, the two dimensions, when you, uh, you get an equivalent sort of versions of jordan wigan transformation, but they, they correspond simply to um, choices of spin structure uh, on your Riemann surface. Um, you get some uh, remarks on where you know this is well parts was explained. So this bonization map was actually described in some sort of the inverse of it, or the fermionization, described by in, in a paper by uh, Hardwaj, Gayot, and myself last year. Um, and so there we s sort of started with the bosonic side, which is uh, some sort of TQFT on a lattice, and then um, uh, did something called fermion condensation and obtained a spin-dependent TQFT. So. But one can also go in the opposite direction. And in fact, uh, the transformation has to do with TQFTs a priori. It just has to do with the, the algebra of fermions. So that's, uh, this has been worked out by uh, Yuan Chen, myself, or being worked out. So I'm done with uh, bosonization in um, uh, two dimensions. Let me just explain why one should expect it to exist in arbitrary dimensions. Um, it was ar actually argued uh, in my paper with uh, Dario de Gaiotta. Um, but I'm going to explain it a bit differently. So there, the argument was based on um, you know, something called uh, generalized global symmetries, or high-form global symmetries. But here I'm going to explain it using more, perhaps, more familiar language or emergent fermions. So namely, um, the idea how to get a system which is sort of fermionic. You start with a, um, you start, uh, you start with a spin system, which doesn't have any fermions, and then you maybe engineer some topological system which has emergent fermions, and then just attach to every excitation of the spin system an emergent fermion. Then the composite is going to behave like actual physical fermions. Uh, so that's a strategy we used in uh, two dimensions, two plus one dimensions, because indeed uh, this we use the fact that some excitation of the toric code, the bound state of E and M particles, is, a, is an emergent fermion. Now, this seems a bit problematic in higher dimensions, not because there's so many no-goal theorem, just because it seems hard to construct um, topological systems in higher dimensions which care, have emergent fermions. For example, there's well-known work 
by Jacob and Rebbe, very old work, 1976, um, showing how you can get fermions out of bosons in three plus one dimensions, but it's pretty elaborate. You have um, young mills theory uh, with monopoles, and there's some uh, Higgs field in the double representation of SU2. So um, it's kind of complicated. Uh, we would like to have something topological, so we don't want to add any lots of degrees of freedom just to get rid of them later on. Turns out, actually, there's a very simple, in fact, universal solution for this problem in all dimensions. Uh, the idea is simply consider Euclidean lattice. Let me just uh, switch from the uh, Hamiltonian language I, which I used so far to somewhat easier to understand Euclidean language. I just want to write down Euclidean action for topological field theory uh, in d plus one space-time dimensions, uh, which has emergent uh, fermions. So I'm going to have a d minus one cocycle with values in z mode two as my basic field. So it's a cachain which is closed. Uh, now, this, uh, I, I, I postulate again that there's a gauge symmetry also, as usual, that if you cycle is shifted by co-boundary, that's a gauge equivalent systems, gauge, gauge equivalent field configurations. Um, and um, so, so it's sort of a higher form gauge field. So in D equals two, that is two spatial dimensions, just the usual one form gauge field. And that's why we get to the two gauge theory. But in higher dimensions, it's D minus one form gauge field. Um, and then I also am going to employ this, uh, well, one of the standard squares, which uh, increase, well, in general, there's this operation in, uh, in cohomology mode two, which increases the uh, degree of the class by, by Q. It's called Q th standard square. But I'm going to consider the, sec the second one, consider the following action. So the action, my, my convention, the action takes values in uh, real numbers, modular integers, because I'm gonna, what I'm going to do with it, I'm going to plug it into, into this partition function like this. I'm going to exponentiate. 2 pi i times the action, and then just sum, well, I forgot the subscript here, and then sum over all, um, um, well, gauge equivalence classes of this uh, gauge field. So the action is very simple, simply the in integral of standard squared of this b. Um, so why, what, what, what's, what's this theory good for? Um, well, if Many people, not, well, I, I myself didn't learn about standard squares until like a couple years ago, so let me just uh, simplify life a bit by looking at the case of uh, d equals 3. For d equals 3, uh, b is a uh, Tuka cycle, so uh, standard square sq2 is simply the, squ the usual cup square. So our action just one half times the, of the cup square. Now, uh, the point is that on a closed variable manifold, for manifold, uh, we have this relation. So one can, one can relate uh, b cup squ squared with the just product of the second, second stiff Whit Whitney class and b. Well, module exact terms. So this is module exact. Um, so first of all, I'm trading this action for this one. And then I'm going to, imp now I'm going to impose the constraint delta b equals zero, modulo two, using Lagrange multiplier, which is a usual gauge field. So I'm going to have a term like delta a cup b, which after, you know, if you just vary respect to a, you're going to get constrained that delta b is zero. And then I still have this term, which I write as w two cup b. But now let's re uh, reinterpret a little bit. Uh, let's uh, see that, uh, let's think about B as Lagrange multiplier. Now B is not constrained, it's just a, a Tuka chain, it's not a cycle. So when you sum over Bs, you get a uh, constraint that um, your A is not closed. It's, it's sum of delta, of delta A and W2 is zero, but A is not closed. Which means that if you try to construct a Wilson loop like this, in the usual way, is it to sort of a Wilson loop, because A is called Z2 gauge field, that's not a topological operator, because if you move around the 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 the, the cont you know the cycle gamma, since a is not closed, you're going to get different results. So that's not a topological observable. However, if you trivialize your second cycle Whitney class, uh, where there's some chain with values in z mode two, then this combination is a topological observable because this combination is closed. So we can define Wilson loops based on the gauge field. Well, we regard A is a Z2 gauge field, but um, they require first to trivialize W2. So they require spin structure, in other words, which means that your ex electric, sort of electric excitation, which couples to the gauge field, is uh, emergent fermion. So that's why uh, we expect this theory with this simple action to lead to emergent fermions.
And uh, well, okay, so th that's the motivation, but then it, to actually work out the two-dimensional version of jordan wigan transformation, I need to first of all convert this Euclidean system to a, a Hamiltonian system. That's fairly straightforward. Uh, and then one can analyze the, again, the, uh, well, define operators, or define um, Hamiltonian, which actually has emergent fermions somewhere, sitting somewhere. Define their hopping operators, analyze their algebra, compare with the al algebra of fermionic hopping operators, and then uh, verify that actually the same, and then um, uh, combine again, take the tensor product of this uh, three plus one dimensional topological theory with the spin uh, Hilbert space and write down the algebra of operators which uh, well, combine hopping operators for spins and for this topological system and define the journal window map. So um, now the general case is not really different. I, the point is simply that this action, this, this always works. When you have some d minus one ca cycle, then sq2 is related to w2 cup b. So as a result, the like argument always works. That's why there's a universal solution to this problem of constructing TQFT with emergent fermions. Uh, and the details are still wor being worked out. So, th so, so basically that, that in principle solves the representation in arbitrary dimension. And I just want to say that there is some slight difference, well, important difference between the case of one spatial dimension and higher dimensions, that in the one spatial dimensions, you don't have any gauge fields when you bosonize. Uh, in other words, uh, you, 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 your uh, bosonized operators still act in the Hilbert space, which is un unconstrained, just tensor product of factors. In higher dimensions, that can just cannot happen. It was clear for a long time, and people remarked on this many times. In higher dimensions, you've got to have some gauge field somewhere. Uh, which means that your Hilbert space is uh, on the bosonic side is going to be not constrained tensor product. You're going to have Gauss law constraints. Uh, and that's maybe not very good from the point of view of condensed matter th uh, theories, but it's perfectly fine from as far as uh, a gauge theory is concer concerned. So, um, so basically what I'm saying here is that you can just, uh, you can just use a, well, this d minus one form gauge theory, gauge field to, to do it in, all dim in arbitrary dimensions. Okay, that's all.